Our Texas state constitution is a bloated, confusing document with nearly 500 amendments. Compare that to the U.S. Constitution, which has only been amended 17 times since it was adopted. Texas's amendments cover everything from who gets taxed for what to whether or not a baseball team can sell raffle tickets. Some of them seem pretty arbitrary. Why couldn't the legislature deal with this in session? Why isn't this just in the tax code? Why is a one-time only bond vote included in our founding document? Some amendments directly violate the U.S. Constitution, and others are so vitally important that it's shocking that the original writers didn't think to include them in the first place. How did it get this way? Well, we have to go back to 1845 when Texas joined the Union. Our first Constitution was pretty similar to the U.S. version, short, sweet, and broad enough to allow government to do its job. It was a pretty good Constitution. But with the Civil War and then Reconstruction, all that got thrown out the window. During the 1860s, Texas went through three constitutions. By 1869, Texas was under military rule by the federal government. Texas adopted a new constitution that year, but it only passed because Confederate sympathizers were barred from voting. That same year, Edmund J. Davis, a Republican, won the governor's race, barely, and began putting Texas back together in ways many Texans weren't happy with. Then, after a controversial election, Davis lost in 1873, but he contested the results and refused to give up the governorship. Democrats were not having it. They climbed ladders to the second floor of the Capitol building and barricaded themselves inside. Davis brought in state troops to occupy the first floor. Eventually, Davis gave up, but when he left, he locked his office door. The Democrats had to break it down with an ax. The next Republican governor wouldn't be elected for over 100 years. In 1876, Texans approved a new constitution, the one we still use today. It was a direct reaction to Reconstruction, an overbearing federal government, and Davis's Republican rule. It outlined a very limited government with a weak executive branch. The Attorney General, Land Commissioner, and others are all directly elected rather than appointed by the governor. The judicial branch was divided in two, criminal and civil, and judges are elected as well. But the writers were so focused on preventing the kind of government control they had suffered in the past that some of their provisions, like a legislature that only meets once every two years, make more sense in the 19th century than they do in the 21st. And rules that are so constricting don't leave much wiggle room for actual governing. This means we need a lot of amendments. On the one hand, that can be a good thing. Citizens get to participate in a more direct democracy. On the other hand, we often have to vote on trivial stuff that should be handled by our elected officials. Or the legislature passes the buck onto us to decide controversial issues. Take one of my favorite proposed amendments, SJR 7 from 1919. On the surface, it's your standard women's suffrage vote, but this one was a double-edged sword. While it would have granted women the right to vote, it also would have taken away the vote for another group, non-citizens. That's right. There was a time in Texas when non-citizen men could vote, but not citizen ladies. Not surprisingly, that measure failed, but most don't. Out of 673 proposed amendments, over 70% have passed. Yet every two years, our constitutional elections have abysmally low turnout, sometimes less than 10%. Texas already has a low turnout rate in general, but without a big name on the ticket to lure us to the polls, most of us don't participate. But even if we're not voting for a person on the ballot, these amendments are proposed by our elected officials and voting for or against their policies holds them accountable for their actions. It says, we're here, we're paying attention and we show up to vote. See you on election day.